up on the screen. Uh, okay, we're live. Uh, Coach's Corner, um, it is Thursday, September 10th, 2020, uh, the day after the apocalypse in the Bay Area happened. Um, okay, so today's Coach's Corner is going to be a more of a discussion. Um, you know, we're, we're talking shop as always, but I want to hear your thoughts as as coaches, and this is based on the Exos um, Continuous Improvement uh, workshop that happened this morning um, that was led by Jenny Noyles, um, who used to be at the Mayo Clinic, um, and now she's part of the Continuous Improvement team. Um, so the webinar this morning was all about eccentric and isometric contractions um, and how we use those types of exercises with our clients in our classes, when they're appropriate, when they're not appropriate. Um, so we had lots of information, then we went to breakout rooms, um, talked about those those prompts that we're gonna be talking about here as a team uh, with each other, came out of the room, talked about uh, the other type of contraction, and then went into different rooms to discuss with different coaches. Um, so for everybody watching this who doesn't know, um, there's three basic muscle contractions, um, you know, that you will probably be experiencing, um, in the real world and in the weight room. So we have our concentric contractions, which is where your muscles contract as they shorten. So you're doing a bicep curl, concentric contraction, because your bicep is shortening, um, as you bend your elbow. Um, isometric contractions, um, probably know it from bodybuilding, somebody holding a bicep curl, flexing as hard as they can. Um, it's also what we see in a plank um, or a bent arm hold that some people uh, had to do, or women, I guess, specifically had to do in the president's fitness test. Um, and then lastly, we have our eccentric contractions, which um, is what really leaves people really sore. Um, so it's where your muscles contract as they're lengthening. Um, an example of this is um, when I was doing my master's thesis, I was um, exploring the effect of compression socks on recovery in runners over 40. Um, a good way to do that is to make their calves really sore. So the way I did that is I gave them a kettlebell um, and they did calf lowers on a box. So they're holding a kettlebell in both hands or in one hand so that they could hold on for balance. Um, they're getting a tie onto their toes as they can. And then they're dropping their heels as low as they can and as slowly as they can. Um, and that lengthening as they're, as they're lowering their heels while trying to stay stable and contract the muscle and lower with control, that's the eccentric contraction. Um, it leaves you very, very sore. The good thing is, um, and we didn't talk about this in the webinar, and I found out after my my thesis experiment, is there's a protective effect, um, and you will not be as sore. Uh, and I think this is really important for us as coaches to know and to communicate to our clients who maybe don't like being sore and you know see that as being too intense. You will never, the, the protective effect lasts for six months. And within those six months, you will not be as sore as you were during that first workout. So the first time, you know, people did calf raises, they were debilitatingly sore. Uh, the second time was not as bad because their body adapted that quickly. Um, so the, the human body is, is absolutely amazing in that way. So, um, those are our three type of, of muscle contractions. The concentric contractions, um, whether you're doing lat pull downs, squats, um, well, squats get a little bit more complicated the way that goes, um, or you're doing more of the traditional weightlifting resistance training stuff, that's usually concentric contractions that we're thinking of. They're part of every workout. We're not going to talk about them. So what I want to talk about first, and we'll talk about isometric contractions first, um is how do us as coaches explain them to our clients um when do we use them um and uh is that different using it one-on-one -on -one or versus in a class so uh we'll start with isometric contractions first and i will say before we dive into this because i'm sure luis is going to go there with his um 
recently working in a physical therapy clinic is isometric contractions. You're holding the joint isn't moving and you're not going to get a lot of growth from the muscle because it's not, it's not moving. Um, but you're going to get a lot of uh, stability and muscle activation and neuromuscular control, and you're teaching that muscle to fire. Um, so it's really used very heavily in rehab situations um, when you're recovering from injury or surgery or you just have muscles that aren't working because you need to literally connect those neurons to the muscle fiber so that they do their job. Um, so let's dive into that. We'll talk shop a little bit and then uh, we'll switch over to eccentric contractions and we will definitely end this before our stretch break. So it's going to be kind of short. So how do you two as coaches use isometric contractions, whether with an injured or pre post rehab client or just general population? Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. I think my main um, goal when using isometrics is getting my client or, or patient or whoever I'm working with um, the opportunity to recruit more muscle fibers. And what that means is having the nerve sending a constant signal to the muscle saying contract, contract, contract. I think the bicep curl is one of the best examples of this really easy to understand. If I'm contracting my bicep and it's just contract, contract, contract my brain is getting an opportunity to recruit as many motor neurons in the muscle as I can. Now, people who don't do that over time, you're not gonna recruit as many motor neurons, therefore you're not gonna have as much control, like you said, Brittany. So um, the, the use of eccentrics and isometrics, mainly isometrics um, with getting people to kind of connect better with the muscles in their body, that's kind of my main use. Um, and it, it's also a great way to, to build strength. Um, usually with isometrics, I'll use them a lot with athletes and I'll use it more to like teach explosiveness and by using like pauses within movement. So like if you're going to do like, you know, um, like a jump squat or something like pausing for a few seconds at the bottom to create that sense of explosiveness. So that way, like if you are, you know, like running the bases in softball, you, you know, you pause for a second, then you got to like cross over and go. So like it works on that, like explosiveness or like the explosiveness of your hips when you're swinging a bat. So I usually use the isometric aspect to like teach like the pause in the middle of a movement to create the explosiveness from like a uh, shortened position. So Jazzy, you use eccentrics and isometrics in your class today, which I thought was very fitting because other coaches I talked to don't know how to integrate isometrics, especially mm -hmm. into their classes because their people want to sweat and work hard mm -hmm. and feel uh, the, the burn and, in their lungs and in their muscles. So explain your, your thought process behind your, your programming today. And you can include eccentrics as well. Yeah. So for um, like eccentric movements, I definitely love using the eccentric in um, when you're when you don't have that same load or if you're trying to make a load feel different. So in terms of body weight, it's perfect because, you know, a lot of us can do you know, I could do body weight squats forever, but like, I don't have that kind of time. No one has that kind of time. So when you slow down that eccentric mo movement and you go nice and slow until you're in that bottom part of the squat, then you're going to be able to still build that strength in the muscle and also like get a little bit of a hypertrophy and a little bit of muscle growth in that eccentric portion of the movement. So slowing down like the either the first portion of your squat. So like squats are definitely different because the eccentric is first where a lot of the times like bicep curls the eccentric is the second portion but that will help like elongate the muscles a little bit more like you slow down the movement and you can switch up like by switching up the tempo in the eccentric you can still create those um, adaptations in the body kind of like what Brittany was talking about earlier so you can still create those adaptations without changing the load or you know last week we talked about volume so like you can switch it up without changing the volume either 
And with like the isometrics, a lot of the times too, I'll use them for, you know, kind of like a burnout, like, you know, we're contracting the muscles, we're making them tired and we're still working them without, you know, getting our heart rate like too high or without like having to do a bunch of burpees or something like that. So we can still again, elicit that um, adaptation by pausing and holding them the movement to create the strength from the isometrically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for someone who doesn't know better, I'm thinking of it in terms of burnout, it's also kind of an active rest from mm -hmm. any kind of cardio. So um, holding that plank for 20 seconds after you do heavily movement based mm -hmm. variations of the plank, it's active rest, but you're still working. Mm -hmm. Uh, Luis, talk to us about uh, eccentrics and how you use them with your clients and classes. Um, I like to use, I, I um, typically will be using a lot of eccentrics and isometrics, um, just kind of within one movement in the workout. Now, when I'm working with clients, I tend to try and get them to a point where, where they can be as comfortable with um, eccentrics and isometrics as they are with concentrics. I feel like a lot of clients that I know, you know, really only focus on the concentric portion. I don't blame them for that. But if I can teach them to, to be as comfortable with the isometric and the eccentric um, movements and, and positions, then they're going to have a much better connection with the rest of their body. They're going to be able to recruit, like I said, more um, motor neurons and be able to have just better function. And if you can function really well, that will also lead to just better movement quality. You'll be able to, to move better for longer and, and move bigger loads for longer. Yeah, yeah. Those eccentrics especially, um, I mean, they make your muscles bigger <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. for sure. So if that's what you're going for, those are helpful. Um, when I'm trail running a lot, you know, bombing down those huge hills and the Marin headlands, uh, my quads are shredded. Mm -hmm. I can't move them for days. Um, and then they get really big, really quick. Um, I would argue they are definitely, those type of movements definitely help you live a more athletic life, which is um, subconsciously what we all want to live a better life and a healthier life. All right, we are all out of time. Um, awesome discussion, really fast discussion. We could talk about this subject for probably another 30, 45 minutes, but mm -hmm. um, I think that will give everybody a little taste of uh, two less common movements. All right, thanks for joining everyone. Thanks for watching and let any of us coaches know um, if you have questions about anything we have talked about.